Thank you, Dale. I'm glad to be here. Dale only gave me 20 minutes, which means I'm not going to finish this speech, but I've never finished one in my life anyway. So I told our pastor to make a sermon immortal. It doesn't have to be everlasting. See, so sometimes you just got to uh, tell them that, but uh, the mind can only comprehend what the seat of the pants can endure anyway. And even Winston Churchill once said, it's hard to save a country in an after-dinner speech. So sometimes even he said that. So I hope I communicate effectively with all of you. I had a patient in last week that said, tell me in plain English what's wrong with me. I don't want any of those science, scientific terms. I said, you're fat and lazy. He said, now use scientific terms so I can tell my wife. So, so <laughs> it's important uh, to be able to communicate. And sometimes it's how you say things that make the difference. In other words, you should tell your wife she looks like a fresh breath of spring, not the end of a cold, hard winter. See, same thing, but different way to, way to say it. A woman said to Winston Churchill once, you're looking pretty cool today. He said, you don't look so hot yourself. She said, so it's how you say it. How you say it that makes the difference. And we have to look at what causes people, to, what incentivizes people. It's like the guy who was dying and they called in his son who was his only heir. And he said, son, I've left everything to you in the will. He said, the boat, the yacht, the airplane, the million dollars in foreign securities, the thousand acre farm, it's all yours right there in the will. And he started fainting rapidly and his son leaned over. He said, father, is there anything I can do for you? He said, get your foot off the oxygen hose. <laughs> so uh, we got to look at where the incentive is. Well, anyway, I wrote this book, The Politically Incorrect Book of Humor, because political correctness is designed to silence our side. It's basically what it is. And uh, so if we use humor on the wings of humor, I've collected over 45 years, profound quotes and one-liners, and there's no book on the market like it. On the wings of humor, you can sometimes disarm the opposition in a lighthearted way when there's tense situations and there's a lot of pressure. Think of a pressure cooker. You let the air out, and you can humor them and send it to your liberal relatives or friends and uh, sometimes make a difference. So I have an optimistic message today because I believe one man with truth is an army and one man with God is a majority. George Orwell said, the more people reject the truth, the more they hate those who speak it. But it's better to light one candle than curse the darkness. And a candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. You know, we live in a time, we used to have Bob Hope and Johnny Cash, now there's no hope, no cash. Uh, <laughs> Congress has two chambers, Sodom and Gomorrah. And some people think we're like the guy who jumped off the Empire State Building and every window we went by, he said, I'm all right so far. See, so. But I have an optimistic uh, message tonight because we, we are at a pivotal time in American history. And tonight the subject I'm talking about is seven duties of a Christian citizen. And those seven duties are, number one, we're commanded to pray, to register to vote, to become informed, to help elect godly people, and to vote. And after election day, keep going and last, make God the issue. Now, I firmly believe the first one on prayer, we would not be a free country had it not been for prayer. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The Bible commands us to pray without teaching, without ceasing. But, you know, 56 men walked into the Independence Hall in hot August day, and they were there for three to four months. They locked the doors, they shut the windows so nobody could hear what the deliberations were because their goal was to draft a little booklet called the Constitution. They had it within their power to form a new country. 56 men from different backgrounds. And they argued and hollered and smaller states wanted sovereignty and larger states wanted more power based on population, and they didn't want a monarchy, they didn't want a king, but they wanted to form a new country, otherwise everything they lived for would be for naught. And at about six weeks, they met, they met an impasse where they were getting nowhere. The most irreligious of all 56 men, the one who claimed not to be a Christian, Benjamin Franklin, stood up. And he said the following words, I have lived, sir, a long time. He was 83 years old, 15th child out of 15th kids. 
He said, I've lived a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proof I see that of the truth that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it possible that an empire can rise without his aid? We've been assured, sir, that in the sacred writings, that except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. I firmly believe this, and without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in the political building no better than the builders of Babel. I therefore beg to move that henceforth prayers imploring the assistance of heaven and its blessings on our deliberations be held in this assembly every morning before we proceed to business with one or more of our local clergy. They voted unanimously to adopt that and after he said that, the whole mood of the assembly changed. When they knew they had to rely on the providence of God without arguing and bickering, if they were ever going to succeed in building a new nation. And you know the words that they said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal. They're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. You know, when I speak to college kids at USC, I'm going to be speaking a week before the election. I said, what's the word inalienable mean? They have no idea. It means God-given, all of our rights, our right to life and liberty. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. These rights are inherent. They're, we're born with them because they're given to us, not by the Supreme Court, not by Congress or the House or the Senate or by any government agency, the right to life given by God. And these are immutable rights, no matter what happens. Today, if our current administration were to draft the Declaration of Independence, I wrote down, here's what they would probably say. We hold the following suggestions and ideas to be possible as long as no one takes offense or objects, in which case we will find a more politically correct non-offensive way to express what we think might be good ideas for a new nation. Now, how many of you would pledge your lives, your fortunes, and sacred honor for that philosophy? What a difference in the mindset that's changed in our country and our culture today. Well, you know, when we look at, the, at what we have to do, we have to pray. We have to register to vote. You know, 50% of Christians aren't registered to vote. 40 million Christians did not vote in the last election. And out of the ones registered, only half of them vote. We're losing our country by default. And we have a moral obligation to vote, no matter what happens. We can't say, my guy didn't win, so I'm not going to vote. You realize do you realize when, when, when we, every church in South Dakota should be registering people to vote at the end of the church service in every sermon and imploring people to register? It's an atrocity. You know, indifference to evil is evil, and we have, to, we have to be able to vote. We're the only nation on earth. You know, there's 195 nations in the world, 7 billion people on earth. What's the difference between America and all the other countries? This Constitution starts out with three words, we the people, we the people. In more to form a more perfect union, we're the only nation where we get to determine who our rulers are. The power rests in us. And our politicians are spending $7 billion to do what? To influence you. That's what it's all about. And we have a moral obligation to register and, and vote. Next, we have to be informed. You know, if you expect to be ignorant and free, you expect what never was or ever will be, said Thomas Jefferson. We have to be informed. You know, when I, was, I went to, when we were at the National Convention, one of the guys spoke, and he talked about a guy by the name of George Whitfield. How many of you remember George Whitfield? George Whitfield, the great American preacher, and I love to read history, but I never grasped that we wouldn't be a free country, wouldn't be for George Whitfield. A great preacher from England, he preached with some bo such bombastic sermons when he started preaching that the churches threw him out of church in England. All the other pastors were jealous of him. 
So he came to America, and he was so bombastic of a preacher, even more than Pastor Brandt, which is hard to believe. But the churches here kicked him out. So he had to preach outside. Well, there's more room outside. And he started gathering crowds of thousands, 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, 20, up to 30,000 people would gather around to hear George Whitfield preach. And he preached four times a day, seven times on Sunday, seven days a week. They said farmers, if they heard George Whitfield was coming, they'd leave their plows in the field and they'd get on their horse and ride 20 miles to hear George Whitfield. They said 80% of the entire nation of all 13 colonies heard George Whitfield preach in person. What a preacher. Preached eight hours a day with no microphone. They said Benjamin Franklin was so impressed with George Whitfield, he built a big stadium for him to preach in. George Whitfield, Wilberforce, who fought slave trade in Europe, his parents that raised him, his uncle and aunt, were saved under the sermons of George Whitfield. The repercussions of one person with the courage of his convictions, he said, I will not be a velvet mouse preacher. And he changed the lives of tens of thousands of people were saved. Now, when our forefathers built this constitution, they said if we let people govern themselves, they could rape, rob, and murder each other. And John Adams said, yes, freedom without virtue is madness. Freedom requires two things, virtue, and it requires individual responsibility. Without those two things, there, are no liber there is no liberty. Well, because of the sermons of George Whitfield, nothing united all the colonies like the Christianity that permeated the entire culture because the kids of the pilgrims and the Puritans were rebellious. Imagine that. <laughs> but he turned the nation around. And you know, a communist scholar came to Harvard, and one of the professors asked him, what is it about America that has impressed you the most? He said, you know, when I study the history of your country, he said, I find people do the right thing because religion is so important. Up until 1960, in the 60s, he said everybody did the right thing because they felt the accountability to a higher power, to Almighty God. It's not because we had a militant police force. And then the courts threw our God out of the schools and to prayer and the Ten Commandments and, and all of a sudden everything started to be dismantled. John Adams said to educate a child without morals is to educate a menace to society. What good does it do to become a great engineer if you use your knowledge to blow up the Oklahoma Trade Center? Character, morality is everything. The, the school that won academic excellence in America they won by such high numbers that they, they did an investigation. They found out they cheated to win. And the president of the class was on O'Reilly. He said, now, you cheated to win. Do you have any remorse? He said, no. Any regrets? He said, no. Any school with the opportunity to get the test answers would have done the same thing to get this award. Well, did the teacher know you were cheating? He said, yes. What did the teacher say? She said, it's our choice. When it's OK to lie, cheat, and steal to get ahead, and that becomes the philosophy of a country. How long can we survive as a nation? And so this is the culture that we're dealing with today. Calvin Coolidge said we're placing our reliance on the principles of self-government. But if the people fail to vote, a government will be developed which is not their government. The whole system of America rests on the ballot box. Unless citizens perform their duty, such a system is doomed to fail. It's critical that we come, become involved and understand the power of one. Now we think, well, my vote won't, it won't make much of a difference. Well, you know, one vote, when Hitler first ran for office, he won by one vote. One less vote, we'd be speaking German instead of English. President Bush won by 500 votes less than one vote per precinct in, in Florida when he ran against Al Gore, and he only won by two electoral votes. South Dakota has three electoral votes. If South Dakota would have voted the other way, a, city, a state, if we were the largest city, if, if we were a city, we'd be the 65th largest city in America. A tiny state like ours changed the course of human history. 
And when we stop and think Tom Daschle, Senator Daschle won by 26 votes statewide. McGovern won by 120 votes statewide. One vote per precinct, less than one vote per precinct. And they were in office for decades. What a difference. When people say, my guy didn't win, so I'm not voting. I say, well, wait a minute. He won. A guy the other day at Alpha Center said, I'm not going to be held accountable for my vote because my guy didn't win, and I'm not going to be voting for anybody. I said, well, you will be held accountable, Pete, because one candidate said on the view that it's OK to abort unborn babies all the way up to the moment of delivery. What a callous disregard for the value of human life created in the image of God, and we're throwing them in the garbage. Why would she care about you and me? And we'll see the duty to die movement be pervasive in the number of tens of millions of babies. Lives are at stake based on whether you vote. 58 million have been destroyed since Roe v. Wade, an activist court. Over 900,000 died in the Civil War due to a racist Supreme Court. And we fought a lot of battles, fought the Nazi battle, and it's critical critical. We can't think of ourselves. We can't think of our opinions. We think about the future of America. And look at the big picture. I look at it like a window washer or a skyscraper. He doesn't see the symmetry of the building. He doesn't see the architecture. He doesn't see the landscape. All he sees is the dirt in front of his nose. We need to back off and see the entire picture of where this country's going. You know, 70% of the American people say we're headed in the wrong direction. We're headed in the wrong direction morally. We're headed in the wrong direction economically. We get, we're less safe than we've ever been. 70% believe we're, we're headed in the wrong direction for our national security. And 68% don't agree with the candidate who wants to keep going that direction. But that candidate's ahead? <laughs> what kind of schizophrenic thinking is this? It makes no sense whatsoever. You know, Herbert Hoover said, we're treating symptoms instead of causes in this country. We're expecting things to come out of our people that haven't been put in there. And we've got to start home by home, community by community, organization by organization, and instill back into our people those reliable traits of character and responsibility upon which this country was founded. Yeah. We don't inherit liberty in our bloodstream. That's when Benjamin Franklin walked out, they, what have you given us, a monarchy or a republic? We've given you a republic if you can keep it. If you can keep it, because those principles have to burn in the hearts and minds of every generation. We can talk about the Constitution, we can sing about it, we can write about it, but if those principles are not eternalized, internalized, in every individual, it's just a piece of paper. And we have powers to be that want to destroy the Constitution. They want to destroy free competitive enterprise. They want to destroy the Judeo-Christian ethic that made this country where our rights come from government of the bureaucrats by the bureaucrats. And they promise everything free. You know, when Bernie Sanders, the socialist communist that ran, he said, we have to recruit people to run for school board and city council. And we need to recruit our people to run for all these different offices. And it struck me, how many Christians are doing that? We have to be informed, we have to be involved. We have our prayer meetings, but nobody's running for leadership. Without leadership, we cannot be saved as a country. George Washington said of all the dispositions that maintain good government, religion and morality are indispensable supports. Europe already has taken over. It's already too late. The number one name in Europe is Mohammed. They elected a Muslim mayor of, of London. And their entire life is religion. Where Christianity, how much more committed should we be? Now we're going to need another George Whitfield, even if we win an election. We're going to need a major revival to save this republic. But otherwise, be prepared, because truth is truth no matter who wins. And whatever the persecution is, I mean, from the Protestant Reformation all the way from the days of John Knox and John Calvin. Uh, during the days of John Knox, up to 20,000 were slaughtered and murdered and burned alive in one day. The history of Christianity is a history of persecution. 
Two-thirds of the New Testament written in jail. 11 out of 12 disciples died as martyrs. Where is this supposed to be a cakewalk? But happiness does not consist in doing what you like. It's having the right to do what you want. It's believing in something that makes a difference. You know, John Kennedy, the day he was shot, he was supposed to deliver the following words. He said, this is a time for courage, a time for challenge. Neither conformity nor complacency will do. So let us not quarrel amongst ourselves when the future of the nation is at stake. Let us stand together with the re renewed confidence in the cause, united in our heritage of the past and our hope for the future, and determined that this land we love shall lead all mankind into new frontiers of peace and abundance. Yeah. Profound prophetic words the day he got shot. Abraham Lincoln said, it is, us for for, it is for us the living. We'll be here dedicated to the great tasks remaining before us, that this nation ha shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from this earth. You know, Brad Wright, who wrote this little brochure on your seven duties of a Christian, he started out a speech once. He said, there's really nothing wrong with abortion. There's nothing wrong with gay marriage. There's nothing wrong with homosexuality. He's, and then he said, provided God does not exist. If Jesus Christ is not the Messiah, we really don't have a leg to stand on. We live in a time of militant atheism. Atheism has tripled in the last decade. You have atheist billboards all over Sioux Falls. And they're converting people. They're converting people. But our challenge today is to each one teach one, each one teach ten. Everybody here talks to, in times of moral, moral crisis, silence isn't golden, it's yellow. Bonhoeffer said, not to speak is to speak. Indifference to evil is evil. When this guy said, I'm not going to be judged because I'm not voting, I said, you're going to be judged just as much by the sins of omission. When you know what's right, and when you look at the big picture of what direction this country will go, they're announcing it in their speeches. We have to vote. Not uh, God's ways aren't our ways. We don't know. I mean, an atheist... Thomas Paine wrote Common Sense, which mobilized our forefathers to fight the Revolutionary War. Benjamin Franklin, the most Ill, ir, irreligious of all, appealed to God to prayer. We don't know. God, Jesus Christ himself chose a bad one. This is not a perfect world. We have to vote. We have to vote. We have to talk to our friends, our relatives. We have to implore every one of them to vote. And 100 people here turns into 1,000, and 1,000 turns into 10,000. 10,000 is the election in every state. If 20% more Christians vote, we win this election. But we have to be bold. Thank you.